several months ago I posted a number of videos on the repair and restoration of a Mimi 803 vintage computer and more recently I've posted a few videos of me trying to boot the same machine from a floppy disk. This is not that machine. Uh, this is actually a Mimi 802, not an 803 and it's an 802 that we believe these discs originally came from. Luckily a good friend had this Mimi 802 and he's let me borrow it to see if I can get it to boot from the floppy disk that we have. He doesn't have any discs and obviously it would benefit him if we can get it to boot and also benefit me by getting the information I need hopefully to get the 803 to boot. They are of course different machines, different operating systems but they do share a very similar floppy drive control electronics. So what I'm hoping to do is compare how this machine accesses the floppy drives and then see how that relates to the 803 and try and track down what the problem is. We believe the problem is in the formatting of the disks but uh, we want to eliminate any hardware faults first. Um, I don't want to just swap the components from this one into the 803 uh, if they were damaged by the machine then obviously it could damage these and if you have been watching the videos then you'll know the very hard parts to find. So this is uh, obviously a, an 802. Unfortunately it doesn't work. Um, the owners never actually switched this on so uh, the first thing I need to do is repair this and get it up to the point where um, it's capable of booting. So don't have the drives for this but they're the same as the 803s and I do have other spare drives I can use as well and of course the emulator so it's mainly the electronics and the, um, the mode of operation I'm trying to investigate. So first thing to do is get the main board out, we'll have a look at it, see how it compares to the 803 and then look at uh, getting it up and running. So this is the chassis out of the 802 if you did watch the videos on the 803 then you'll see this is pretty much identical. You'd have to have the two side by side to spot the difference. The main difference is this is in much better condition. Uh, however, I still went through the uh, usual uh, course of actions. I've taken the power supply out, disconnected it from the main board, uh, checked the fan, that's fine, and as usual found the uh, collection of uh, blown up caps. Unfortunately this one's already failed uh, and I assume that uh, that's the point at which the um, previous owner that uh, ran this uh, stopped using it. I don't know if this has done much damage to the main board, it certainly did on the 803 but uh, it doesn't always so uh, we'll carry on going through the uh, testing process and see how far we get. So I've replaced the capacitors, so there's one here, a couple here and if you're not familiar with um, these power supplies, they're relatively simple. They're very similar to modern switch mode supplies. The main difference is that the feedback from the secondary output stage back to the primary stage is through a transformer rather than through an optocoupler. So if you're interested, I won't go into too much detail with this supply, but we'll have a quick look at the schematic. don't know how clearly this will come out on the camera. Uh, but what we have is a filter and some protection coming in, um, common mode uh, filters, that sort of thing, and then a bridge rectifier. Slightly unusual arrangement here, we've got um, four capacitors, that's these large capacitors here, and they're in a series pairs, so there's two pairs in series. There's a jumper, which is this jumper here, and it's labelled 115 volts to 40 volts. And the way this works is in the 230 volt position it's not connected to anything and then it's just a standard bridge rectifier and the capacitors are in series. And uh, there's also some inductive filtering uh, as well. Uh, but when you put it into the 115 volt position, which is this position, then this is configured as a voltage doubler. So this then becomes effectively the ground point and um, then on each successive half cycle of the mains you're going positive to one end negative to the other and it doubles the voltage. So the voltage here is the same irrespective of whether you're running it on 115 or uh, 230 volts. Uh, that then goes through to the usual switching elements. You've got a, a transformer and uh, usual transformer with 
uh, standard feedback uh, system and this forms the uh, input switching side of the transformer so all you need to do to control the output of course is just uh, control the switching of this transistor which is this device here and the way this is achieved is the 5 volt rail is monitored this is the 5 volt high current rail there are two 5 volt rails on this supply now this is the high current rail it comes down and it goes down to this monitor circuit down here there's a, a voltage uh, divider network here you just select resistors here to adjust the 5 volts so it's correct for a particular load uh, and then the feedback is arranged through this transformer so this dotted line shows that these uh, coils are on a, a common uh, core and that's this device here and uh, this just uh, gives you a, a feedback system to enable the um, the closed loop that you need to control the uh, 5 volt rail you've then got um, this device here which is an SCR which is this and this is the usual crowbar protection so um, if the 5 volt rail goes above about 6 volts then this SCR turns on it clamps the 12 volt rail down to ground and it kills the um, output from the supply which because these are on a common uh, transformer the 5 volt and the 12 volt it uh, brings down the 5 volt as well so this is just protection and then for the uh, low current 12 volt and 5 volt supplies and then for the low current outputs you just have a couple of 7 8 uh, series uh, linear regulators uh, and that's these two components here and they've got their own separate windings and uh, single diode rectifier and capacitors and uh, that's these uh, devices here so it's all very simple um, there's not a great deal that can go wrong with it it's mainly things like failed capacitors you can get um, this transistor uh, failing in which case you'll just it'll just keep going into uh, restart mode just sit there kick, uh, ticking um, if you find the voltage is wrong you may need to adjust these uh, I've found these sometimes when the voltage has not been correct and it's just really a case of uh, adjusting resistor values uh, to get the uh, the feedback loop correct to give you the correct output voltage uh, and that's pretty much it in terms of fault finding if there's no output at all chances are this is not switching and um, the only thing I found uh, wrong with this in the past has been uh, this device uh, normally this is quite reliable I've never actually found one of these failed um, I'm sure that some people have but I've been fairly lucky uh, this supply didn't work after I changed the, um, the capacitors it wouldn't uh, start up uh, and that turned out to be uh, this device down here so I've replaced that and uh, next thing is to give it a, another test um, if it is continually shutting down you can disconnect the output and take the SCR out which is this uh, at least that will then give you some means by which to uh, to try and test it but uh, I advise you turn the input voltage down if you do that um, simply because uh, otherwise you can exceed the rating for some of the uh, capacitors okay so I've got it uh, connected to the um, auto transformer we'll power it up one other thing that you do need to do with these supplies is they often will not run properly unloaded if they're completely unloaded and I've got this disconnected of course uh, then again the output will immediately go over voltage it'll, uh, the crowbar will kick in and then it'll shut down and then it'll restart and you'll just hear it as a series of uh, ticking sounds uh, and the way to test if it is over voltage is to turn the input voltage down and see if the ticking stops uh, to get around that um, it's just uh, simply plugging in a dummy load so I've got a very simple dummy load that I use it just needs to, uh, 100 milliamps or so to load up the supply a little bit and that allows the feedback system to work uh, what I'll do is I'll disconnect this and show you what I mean and what happens without a load connected at all so we'll turn on the supply it's not that it turned down I'll put the microphone close to the supply and hopefully you'll be able to hear it. So currently there's 100 volts going into it. I've got the microphone very close and no ticking. And the output voltage will be about 6 volts at this point. I'll bring the meter in and show this in a minute. And uh, you can see how the voltage uh, limit kicks in and uh, causes it to tick. 
find that start to increase the input voltage. Hopefully you can hear it ticking, uh, and that's just the over voltage uh, crowbar uh, killing the output and it's cycling the power supply and it's restarting. So I'll just demonstrate that with the test meter. So I'll bring the test meter in. We'll hook it up. So this is the high current supply we're looking at. There is a low current uh, 5 volt on here as well. I'll turn on the supply. It's a fairly low input voltage that we've got. Start to increase it, and we'll get to 90 volts. The um, switching starts up, and we're getting 5 volts out, which seems fine. But if I now start to increase the voltage, you'll see that the output voltage on the 5 volt rail is now starting to climb. And when we get around 6 volts, you can see it's now starting to cycle because it's exceeding the um, the protection voltage and the SCR is uh, killing the output. So I'll just connect the dummy load. And we'll turn it back on. And you can see it's got now to 5.1 volts and it's stopped going up, it's, it's regulating and I can go all the way up to 240 volts. We can hear the fan starting up as well. So in other words, once we get above about 150 volts, 160 volts, then we reach the required output uh, value, the regulation kicks in and it limits the uh, voltage to 5 volts. But if it's completely unloaded, it will just keep cycling and um, uh, you, you won't get a, a sensible output voltage. So just bear that in mind if you're testing these. If you're getting no output at all, then as I said, uh, start looking at um, these devices around here. That's the fault I had with this one. And um, it's usually fairly easy to sort these out, but um, just bear in mind, you do need to have some sort of load connected for them to work properly. Okay, well I'll flip this over and we'll have a look at the main board. So this is the main board for the 802. There are two boards in the 802, unlike the 803, which just has one big board. Uh, I've taken the second board out. I just want to minimize the number of components that are at risk uh, when I first power this up. The next step after uh, checking the supply itself and before I connect the supply to the main board is to get a test meter and measure across the voltage rails and check the resistance to make sure there are no shorts. I have already taken out the DRAMs, I uh, don't want to risk those, and I've also taken out the uh, ROM. Now, one thing with this is because it uses multi supply DRAMs, if one of the supply rails uh, has failed, then these can be taken out by the other two supply rails. And that's one of the main failure modes you get on these old machines. So uh, don't be tempted to connect it up unless you've fully checked all three rails. And what I found on this machine was that there was a short on the minus 12 volt rail and that came down to this tantalum capacitor. So if I just put the meter across it, so I've disconnected one end of it. Um, you can see it's reading 15 ohms, which is obviously wrong. And then across the rail now is uh, fine. So I need to replace that. The other rails measure fine. So I've already been through this once, as you can see. I didn't want to bore you with the details. I went through this with the 803. But if you do want to see this sort of testing, the initial testing, um, then let me know. Just leave a comment and I will post uh, videos including this part of the process on future repairs. So what I can do now is uh, reconnect the power supply and uh, I'll replace this capacitor first and then we can uh, power it up and see if we're getting uh, any uh, activity on the board. It won't run of course because uh, we haven't got the ROM uh, or the DRAM fitted and um, so I'll do that in the next video and uh, hopefully it's going to be a lot easier to get this one up and running than it was with the 803.